Hi, everybody. Welcome to week two of Political Psych. What I want to do is share my screen with you real quick and jump into our chapter on personality and politics. So first off, who cares, right? Like when do personality types kind of matter in political psychology? And the answer is personality predicts behavior. Um, the personality traits that people espouse um, are just, it's just a fancy way of saying, how do people think, feel, and behave that is common to them across time, across situations? And the more you understand about different personality types, how, how different people are going to react differently in different situations. When you understand that, then you understand why certain political leaders are going to rise to power and be more influential or less influential in certain political situations and why different personality types of leaders are going to resonate differently with different types of constituents. So when you understand like the personality traits common amongst a group of people, you might uh, get a better insight, you might be able to kind of glean why they prefer one policy versus another, one political leader rather than another. And there are a lot of different theories of personality, of how do you describe personality traits, which ones are really important for kind of talking about people, and then later which, which, which uh, theories explain why people develop different personality traits differently from one another. So first let's start off talking about trait theory. Trait theory, often referred to as the five-factor model of personality, for short, let's call it the big five. Um, believe it or not, when you look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary and you pull out all of the kind of adjectives that describe people's personality traits, you find there's 4,622 different personality traits. A ton, right? Way too many personality traits to be useful. So instead, what personality psychologists have done is realize that there's a lot of overlap between some of those personality traits, right? Someone who describes themselves as social and gregarious and fun-loving and party-oriented and loquacious. And it's like, you're kind of describing the same person, right? You're describing someone who's extroverted, who enjoys being around other people. So what they did is this fancy statistical technique called a factor analysis, basically kind of boil down all 4,622 traits into the most kind of cardinal or the most like central personality traits out there. The ones that do the best job of describing people and predicting their behavior. And then over time, there's been some sort of disagreement on exactly what that number is. But the, the theory that has the most support for describing personality traits is the big five, the five factor model. And those five personality traits are openness to openness to new experiences, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism or emotional instability. And one really helpful way of like remembering what these five personality traits are is the acronym OCEAN, O-C-E-A-N, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So let's talk about each one of these five descriptive personality traits and how it relates to politics. So the first personality trait is openness to new experience. What's wild about every personality trait is it is normally distributed, meaning some people are gonna score really high on openness to experience and some are gonna score incredibly low, but most are gonna score in the middle, right, on average. So when you start graphing it, it really shows like this kind of normal distribution where most people, about 68% of people are gonna fall right around the average, plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. And only a few people out there are gonna have really high or extreme personality traits out there. Openness is no different. So people who score high in openness to new experience love trying new things. They love going to college. They love taking new electives. They love kind of GE and like bouncing back and forth and like learning new things. They love eating at new restaurants. They wanna, you know, go for you know thai food and then mediterranean food and then like you know uh korean food and like himalayan food like just trying all the new kind of like um, random new new places that pop up you want to try those new experiences very different than someone who's low in openness to experience where they're like i'm good with applebee's like i know the cheeseburgers are good there let's keep running it back don't mess with a good thing that sort of individual difference is openness to experience when it comes to vacations, right? Someone high in openness to experience is like, let's go to Japan because we've never been before. 
right? So they grab like a weird pebble off the beach in Japan, you know, and then like use it to decorate their apartment, you know? So they're like, you know, choosing kind of sentimental things that showcase their openness to new experience. Very different than someone who's low in openness to experience where it's like, let's go down to Newport Beach, right? Because we know the, you know, you know, it's always a good time, you know, uh, we know the restaurants, we know, you know, what the beach is like, we know where to stay, where to park, like, let's just run it back. It's a sort of individual difference. People that score high in openness to a new experience are also open to like new sort of ideas. They're interested in, in like sci-fi and Lord of the Rings and like, they're kind of rolling with these like, you know, weird aliens that are invading and, you know, this ring that needs to be destroyed, like all these kind of new ideas. They're like, yep, yep, okay, I'm getting it, you know, open to this new experiences. Whereas people that are low in openness to experience, it's like, give me an autobiography. Give me something that's predictable that I know how it's gonna end. Um, the reason why I'm bringing up openness to experience is that there are political differences in openness to experience. What we find is that people that identify as more politically liberal, um, so more, more progressive in their ideas, tend to be uh, score higher on openness to experience. So when there's problems um, with, with the economy, what, sh what should we do? Right. Someone who's higher in openness to experience is like, well, let's start, you know, trying different things. Let's think outside the box here. Let's try a more kind of socialist idea. Let's try taxing the rich. Let's try these different things. Whereas someone who's more politically conservative tends to score lower in openness to experience. They're like, no, 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 like let's run it back to what worked before. Like, um, so they tend to be more kind of like cognitively conservative. They want to um uh be less kind of risk averse and not venture out as much. Um, the second trait in the big five is conscientiousness. And conscientiousness is a uh, fun word to say, hard to spell. In short, what conscientiousness is really kind of getting at is how efficient and organized someone is. Someone who's high in conscientiousness has a incredibly well-organized like office. Every paper has a place. Um, when they're taking notes in school, like every class has a different folder. They're keeping all of their documents really well organized. They love Excel. They love like highlighters and organizational systems and just like just a really efficient way of like finding and accessing info. Totally different than someone who's low in conscientiousness, where it's like, whatever, like homework, throw it in the backpack somewhere, I'll find it later. Um, when it comes to looking at someone's house, for instance, someone who's highly conscientious everything's going to be put away everything's going to be really organized really kind of efficient when you walk you know into their kitchen for instance it's like okay like if i'm cooking here then the spices need to be over there and then the um the the like scraping utensils and spoons and all this sort of stuff needs to be right here right next to the stove so i can access them, them easily and the plates need to be over by the table like they're really kind of thinking it through whereas someone who's low in conscientiousness like this doesn't even cross their mind they're like, huh, here's a drawer. Let's just like shove some stuff into it to get it out of the way. So what's interesting is for these traits that are so central or cardinal to who people are, if you know what you're looking for, these personality traits leave a wake of behavioral residue in their path, which is just a fancy way of saying that if someone's personality trait is so strong, it's going to predict their behavior. And if you're looking at the behavior that people leave in their path, how they organize their office, what's in their trash can, what sort of music they listen to, things like that. You can accurately infer someone's personality based on their, um, on the behavior that they leave in their wake. Conscientiousness is no different, right? Up here, we have someone who's highly conscientious, someone down here, very much low in conscientiousness. And we also find political differences in this personality trait as well. People that are cognitive, people that are ideologically conservative, um, score higher in conscientiousness. They like order. They like boundaries. They like um, uh, more straightforward kind of categorical kind of thinking. So when it when it comes to problems of like, hey, what are we going to do about the number of 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 the amount of immigration within the US. For them, it's like, well, we have a border, right? We have like people that are here legally versus illegally. We have a border and like this border is going to be, a, you know, the sort of boundary to kind of separate. 
you know, from a from a highly conscientious perspective, like that makes sense, right? A border. Whereas people are, are low in conscientiousness, realize like there's not going to be like a physical border. Sometimes there's going to be rivers. Sometimes there's going to be radar and surveillance and and you know ice and police and you know things like that to kind of regulate what the border looks like. A lot more kind of what might seem a little bit more messy and nuanced for someone who's high in conscientiousness, who tends to be more politically conservative. They're not uh, appreciating that sort of like nuance and messiness of it. They want tightly kind of organized conscientious uh, policies. The same thing when more science and research is coming out about gender and gender as being a social construct as compared to kind of biological sex. For someone who is um, more ideologically conservative, this idea that there might be like, you know, more than two genders or gender along a, a continuum, you know, from like more androgynous to more kind of stereotypically masculine and feminine, that's um, for someone who's conscientious, a little messy. So they, they often think of the world in more kind of simplistic categories of like, you know, are, are you a man or a woman, for instance, and don't fully um, um, latch on to as quickly the idea of like gender versus sex, gender identity versus gender expression, and so on. So it's not surprising when you um, see these sort of differences in policy and um, stances on different politically sensitive issues, you find liberals and, um, liberals and progressives kind of varying. It might be due to the differences in their personality traits as well. Um, the third trait in the big five is extroversion. So extroversion is more than just being a people person. It really refers to what is your like baseline arousal level so for someone who is highly extroverted, they tend to be under aroused as a baseline. So, um, you know, when someone is under aroused, they seek out more stimulating environments to make them feel kind of normal, to kind of hit their, their body to a kind of homeostatic level that it was, you know, uh, normally that they prefer it to be at. So people that are extroverted seek out social situations. When it comes to studying, they don't want to study in the library all by themselves. They want to form a study group. They want to be around other people because that provides that sort of arousal and stimulation for them. Introverts, on the other hand, are the exact opposite. Introverts' baseline arousal level tends to be really high, so they seek out less stimulating environments to kind of calm things down, to kind of lower the temperature in the room. So if the radio is playing and there's the TV going, Introverts are like, no, like I'm gonna go study my room by myself, or I'm gonna go into a nook in the library where no one's gonna be there. And kind of like lower their arousal level to that kind of homeostatic kind of normal level. And what's really interesting is when you ask both introverts and extroverts after a really kind of stressful week, how do you unwind? Not, you know, do you enjoy going to parties? Do you enjoy people? It's like, yeah, like we're social creatures. You know, most people like enjoy being around other people. But when you ask people when you're worn down, what is going to recharge your battery? Some people on a Friday night are like, leave me alone, right? Give me a bottle of wine, give me Netflix. I'm just going to chill. No one talks to me. That's a sort of introversion of like getting yourself back to that homeostatic level by isolating yourself from other people, um, kind of lowering your own naturally high arousal level. Whereas extroverts are like, it's been a stressful week. I need to be around other people, right? I'm typically running pretty low on this arousal level. Let me seek out a club, a bar, a cut, like, you know, line dancing, whatever it's like, anything kind of stimulating around other people. And what's interesting is that there aren't um, differences in ideology when it comes to extroversion. There are um, Republicans and Democrats that are highly extroverted and some that are highly in introverted. The only sort of difference that you start seeing in political side is that leaders tend to be more extroverted than followers. So your people who decide to run for politician or your politicians who decide to run for office are more likely to be extroverted, which makes a whole lot of sense, right? When you have to go kind of house to house, town hall to town hall, public event after public event, surrounded by committee after committee and bring all this information together. What, you know, fundraising, decision making, and connecting with the community, a lot of those uh, environments seem to be well suited for an extroverted personality type. So it's not surprising that more leaders tend to be extroverted rather than introverted. And that's true for both Republicans and Democrats. 
liberals and conservatives. Um, the fourth personality trait is agreeableness. So agreeableness just kind of refers to how long, um, how likely is someone just to kind of go along with the flow? Do they value this sort of idea of social harmony and getting together and community and like no waves? Whereas someone who's low in agreeableness, right? Someone who is very disagreeable is likely to be on the debate team, is more likely to um, kind of talk about um, uh, why they're right and you're wrong and like engaging in, in debates about politics and things like that. Um, what's interesting is there um, are not major differences in agreeableness between political parties. Um, instead, what you're finding more and more on, on, on TV is when you're having kind of debates on television about a policy. Um, if you bring in two agreeable people to talk about it, what they're going to do is like value, you know, really focus on how they're similar, focus on how like they're, you know, working together to solve this shared problem. They might have different solutions on what that might be, but there's a lot of overlap there that they can draw upon. Doesn't really make for the most exciting TV, right? Um, so instead, what you're finding is TV sources bringing more disagreeable personality types on. People who are yelling and screaming and like saying why they're right and the other team's wrong and how like error is operating in their eyes, but not, not, not their own current party. And it's leading to a lot more what feels like polarization. And that could just be a function of like really disagreeable, disagreeable people being on TV, kind of talking about why why Democrats or Republicans are right or wrong, for instance. And the fifth descriptive personality trait within the big five is neuroticism. Neuroticism is really referring to like emotional instability. How moody do you tend to be? The emotions of life, the highs and the lows, like how often are you feeling some of these negative emotions like anxiety and fear and threat and impulsivity and things like that? And what you find is that there are subtle differences between liberals and conservatives when it comes to neuroticism. What you find is that more ideologically liberal people tend to be more neurotic or less emotionally stable. And there's a few different theories out there for why that might be. A couple of theories um, argue that some of the issues in the liberal platform focus on discrepancies. They focus on systemic problems like racism still absolutely existing on, on gender gaps in pay in this inequality between the rich and the poor. And because they focus so much on inherent inequality within systems, being exposed to that sort of negative things makes them more um, moody and sad and angry and threatened and fearful and you know just kind of negative about, about those negative experiences in life. Other theories out there kind of disagree and say, hey, maybe the reason why people that are more ideologically conservative are less likely to be neurotic, right? They're more likely to be emotionally stable is because of other personality traits. Conservatives tend to be more optimistic and happier in life. You know, in general, they tend to have more internal locus of control, thinking if there's a problem, like they can solve it by doing something differently themselves. So anyway, a couple of different theories out there, but with any trait theory, like the big five, they're really just describing here are the big five traits and are there ideological differences between them? So um, the things to major kind of take away is that conservatives tend to be more conscientious, yeah. more emotionally stable, right? Less neurotic. And then um, when it comes to openness to experience, you have uh, liberals scoring higher in openness to experience. And that's often referred to as the kind of cognitive rigidity of the right hypothesis. What's interesting is when you look at US presidents, you're kind of curious, like for these US political leaders, how do they fare on different personality traits? So what personality and political psychologists have done is gone through their presidencies. They've read their speeches, they've interviewed their vice presidents, they've interviewed their, 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 you know, their friends, their loved ones, their cabinet, and kind of gotten these kind of snapshots of generally what are their personality levels like? And they've standardized these with T scores. 
So T scores, think of it as kind of ranging from like zero to 100 with an average score of about 50 with a standard deviation of 10. And what you find is that on average, on av average being like really close to 50 for, for the US population, US presidents tend to be slightly more neurotic than average, tend to be slightly more extroverted than average, which makes sense, right? They're running for office. They tend to be slightly less open to experience, about half a standard deviation below the mean here. Um, they tend to be less agreeable than others, right? Especially if they were, if they came through the primary experience of like a lot of candidates in their party, which one is really going to um, uh, best represent that group. Occasionally, you will have really agreeable candidates saying, hey, like I can work together with a lot of different people, I can reach across the aisle. But when you have a lot of people with the same kind of beliefs, you often have more extreme members of those parties emerging as the leader of, of the Republican Party, of the Democratic Party. So it's not surprising that U.S. presidents with our two-party system would be slightly let, would be moderately less agreeable than most folks. But they also tend to be more conscientious and detailed and organized and efficient with their time than others, which also, again, kind of makes sense given the scope of the job. What's really interesting is when you kind of look at specific US presidents, like George Washington, for instance, you see just scoring off the charts um, more than two standard deviations above the mean. So in the you know, 95th percentile, basically, of the most conscientious people within the US, which makes a whole lot of sense, right? If you were the first US president, it makes sense to like follow the rules, be organized, be efficient, kind of understand the scope of what's going on and kind of set that template for all of the future presidents as well. Um, other presidents like Abraham Lincoln, for instance, some things that really jump out is um, although he was more neurotic, more extroverted, more agreeable, conscientious than the average person, you see a big jump here compared to um, openness to experience. Most US presidents tend to be lower in openness to experience than average. Whereas Abraham Lincoln tended to be significant, uh, about 1.6 standard deviations above the mean in openness to new experience, which makes a whole lot of sense because at the time, uh, issues like slavery were really kind of polarizing between the North and the South. And then when it comes to like, what are options? What can we do? Should we have a civil war? Should we pass the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery? But you saw someone like Abraham Lincoln being significantly more open to experience and embracing a lot of those outside the box ideas at the time. And I'm very grateful that he did. So anyway, that is the trade approach. Um, the big five is just descriptive. This is what personality traits are like. And I share it because there are ideological differences in, in several of those per personality traits. So given that personality traits can be really cardinal or central to people, and that personality does, to a certain extent, predict behavior, when you can accurately infer what people's personality traits are like, then you can um, uh, more, more often than not like accurately infer what their political values are based on that, which is exactly what Cambridge Analytica did in the presidential election where Hillary Clinton was running against, uh, was running against Donald Trump. And, uh, there, were, there was allegations and evidence for election interference. You know, folks from, you know, from Russia were creating Facebook ads, misinformation, and they were selectively like seeking out people that were, um, you know, based on their likes on Facebook to be more open to experience and liberal or lower in openness to experience and more conservative, and then kind of catering different messages to different groups to just rile up the animosity to fuel some of that misin misinformation out there to think that there was a far more disagreement between the candidates than there actually was. Which anyway, led to a big, um, uh, a big kind of monkey wrench in our relations with Russia and interference and our democracy and political process. But anyway, like how did that all happen? With personality. When you understand people's personality traits, you can accurately make a bunch of inferences about them about their behavior, their thought patterns, but also their ideological values as well. So anyway, the trait theory is really great at just describing what people are like, 
but it doesn't talk about why. How did they get that way, right? How does personality um, uh, grow and change? How is it shaped throughout our lives? Um, what is the function of personality? Things like that. So another theor th uh, theory or approach that gets brought up a lot is the psychoanalytic approach to personality. So whenever you hear psychoanalytic, I want you to think Freud, right? Sigmund Freud. Freud argued that our personality is both consciously visible, like we can talk about what our personality traits are like, but we also have an unconscious aspect to our personality that we aren't aware of, but is under the water. It is massive. It's that iceberg um, that, that predicts a lot of our like nonverbal ways of of who our friends are, what TV shows we kind of gravitate towards, what our kind of gut tells us of voting behaviors and things like that. So anyway, Freud argued that the structure of personality consisted of kind of three, three different levels. You had the id, the ego, and the superego. So let me talk about each one of those. Um, the first one is the id. And the id operates on this sort of uh, pleasure principle. What uh, makes you feel good? Just go and do it. It's kind of like the, you know, the devil on one shoulder saying like, if you like this, go and take it. Um, the id is the only, uh, according to Freud's theorizing, the id is the only personality construct present at birth, right? These little kids, these little diaper balls of id, it's like, I want. I'm hungry, so I'm gonna scream and cry until I get no. I'm tired, I'm gonna scream and cry until someone gives me a warm you know, blanket, swaddles me up and lays me down in a crib. Um, if the baby is like uncomfortable, has a wet diaper, like I'm gonna scream and cry until you know I get what I want. It's operating very hedonistically on this pleasure principle. But I don't know about you, like kids can't constantly go around like, hey, I want that toy, let me rip it from you. Or I wanna go down the slide, let me push you off instead. Instead, like you can't just constantly go around doing whatever you want to do all of the time. You can't just listen to your id. So Freud argued that later on through a series of psychosexual stages, right? The ways that kids interact with their parents um, and, and um, uh, focus on what brings them pleasure throughout life, their id gets balanced by creating a super ego. So if the id is the devil on one shoulder, the superego is kind of like the angel that Ned Flanders on the, on, on the other shoulder. The superego is kind of like that Jiminy Cricket conscience. What should you be doing? So notice the id is like, what do you want to do? The superego is what should you do? You know, what would your like mom and dad say that you should do? What would your Sunday school teacher say that you should do? What would the Bible say that you should do? And instead of operating on this sort of like pleasure principle, like the id, the super ego is operating on this um, uh, I, um, ideal principle. It's like, you know, what should we be doing? How can we live up to societal expectations? I um, uh, shouldn't push this person. Instead, I should share my toys with them instead. I shouldn't um, oversleep. I should actually get up early and study instead. So Freud argued that you have the id on kind of one shoulder you have the super ego on the other shoulder. And that led to conflict. I want to do this, but I shouldn't do that. How do I kind of navigate those sort of competing demands? And the ways that people learn to navigate the id and the super ego help shape who they are. Do they listen more to the id? Are they more impulsive and aggressive and takers in life? Or do they listen more to their super ego? Are they more restricted and controlled and listening to things like a higher power and calls for their life and things like that? That can create a lot of stress, a lot of conflict for people. And what Freud argued is that the ego or the third part of your personality that developed the last really helped you navigate the id and the super ego. Your ego operates kind of like a referee. Like, okay, sometimes let's listen to the id, sometimes let's listen to the super ego, let's compromise and make sure that we're well balanced. And that was the goal of personality to be well adjusted, be strong enough to deal with the stresses that come with life. Freud argued that you need a sufficiently strong enough ego to navigate those competing demands. 
but not everyone was like that, right? Some of us had like really bizarre childhoods where the id was in control or the super ego was in control. And Freud argued that through these kind of uh, stages of kind of growing up, your personality was a function of your, your relationship with your parents and the ways that you found uh, comfort and, and uh, pleasure when you were a kid. So interesting theory, kind of bizarre, and it gets even more bizarre when Freud was talking about how kids develop their personality. Freud argued that kids go through a series of psychosexual stages. Disclaimer, Freud was wrong about this. He emphasized, emphasized sex way too much. But anyway, it gets brought up a lot from a historical perspective. Um, and even in political psychology, some of the early personality and political psychologists, when they were describing like, why would someone like Hitler rise to power? Why would people in, in Nazi Germany right, resonate with someone like Hitler? They often leaned, leaned back and brought up um, psychoanalytic theory. They often brought up these psychosexual stages to explain like how Germany was different than America and why we would have someone like Roosevelt and they would have someone like Hitler, for instance. So anyway, um, without further ado, let me kind of talk about what some of these psychosexual stages are that Freud was theorizing about. The first one is when kids are born, they are first in this kind of oral stage, meaning the mouth kind of oral is the kind of root of pleasure. They are, uh, they are breastfeeding, they're eating their bottles, they have their pacifiers, like to soothe the child, like the mouth is a source of pleasure. Um, they are sucking their thumbs, you know, things like that. Um, when they're playing, when they're exploring the world, like they see something, they pop it into their mouth. So uh, mouth is the focal point early on, and the id is the only thing present. I want it, I'm going to take it, I'm going to eat it, I'm going to drink it. Afterwards, the kid starts growing up, and the um, uh, focus on the mouth kind of shifts towards, towards the second kind of anal stage. In this case, you know, the kid, you know, two, three, starts potty training. Um, and there's a lot of focus on like cleanliness, like how well did you wipe? Are you being attentive to like your symptoms? Like, are you having to pee? Like how much did you drink before? You know, are you feeling a little uncomfortable or are you doing a little pee dance? Like, are you being efficient and like detailed and organized? Are you wiping well? Or are you like, whatever, sometimes I make it, sometimes I don't, I have accidents. Um, you know, sometimes I wipe, sometimes I don't, whatever, you know, and you find these, these like interesting experiences with how kids go through this anal stage. And it's a direct reflection of how, of how their parents or their primary caregivers are helping them kind of navigate this. And Freud argued that some kids get stuck in this sort of anal retentive stage where they focus so much on cleanliness and order and like details and things like that that later on they grow up and they become accountants. Or when they are stressed in life, they start cleaning, right? Kind of stress cleaning around their house. Freud would argue that's because when you're an adult and you're stressed out, you are regressing or going back to an earlier psychosexual stage that brought you a lot of pleasure, like you know, being anal retentive. The other folks out there that are kind of anal expulsive are super messy, super unorganized, not efficient, went through this stage, not valuing that sort of like cleanliness and attentiveness to their, you know, to their bodies. Anyway, um, the reason why I bring this up is because phrases like, oh, that person's being so anal, for instance, is really a throwback to like anal retentiveness in the Freudian anal uh, stage. Um, Freud also kind of argued of like, why do people smoke? Why do people chew on their pencils when they're nervous? Well, maybe they're regressing to an earlier stage where they last found pleasure, like in the oral stage. So once these kids grow up, they start becoming potty trained. They start hanging out with mom, with dad. What they quickly start realizing is, is these little boys start hanging out with mom. And they're like, mom is awesome. Um, when I'm hungry, like mom is there, she asked me, do I want macaroni and cheese or, or do I want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Both are great. You know, when you're scared, when you're tired, like mom is there with a hug, with a cuddle, with, with uh, blankets and like, you know, just con you know, constantly there and present to kind of soothe you. 
So what Freud argued is in this phallic stage, um, little boys started becoming uh, sexually attracted to mom, to their opposite sex parent. And they became aware of their own genitalia of what these little boys had, have is not the same thing that mom has. And what they start, you know, realizing is, you know what, I really like mom. I want to be with mom, but there's a problem. Mom's already married, right? Mom's married to dad instead. And if dad were to find out that the little boys are sexually attracted to mom and want to replace dad, dad's going to be ticked off. Dad is going to be so angry that dad will castrate the child. Meaning like dad's going to so be so angry that dad will like threaten to like cut off the little boy's penis, which would create this sort of castration anxiety for these kids. I know it's out there super bizarre. Well, Freud thought this was true. So these boys, like how they dealt with castration anxiety, right? Because of, of, of fearing their dad is, is they realize, you know, I can't be with mom because dad's going to cut off my penis. Instead, what I can do, you know, uh, during these more advanced periods of kind of ruminating, kind of thinking about what's going on, and then later when they started hitting puberty, is you know what, if I start acting a whole lot like dad, then maybe if I identify with dad, then I can attract someone like mom, someone my own age, someone who's single and not already married. And that way I can, I can marry someone just like my mom if I identify with you know, with dad. So that's how Freud thought that like kids' personality was kind of shaped and how they took on more masculine stereotypical gender roles is because of this castration anxiety and attractiveness to mom. Interesting, right? But it only focuses on women. Later on, people kept pushing Freud, like, what about these little, what about little girls? How do they, how do their personality shapes get, get, um, uh, get formed. The id saying, hey, you want this. You want to be with your opposite sex parent. Your super ego saying incest is wrong. Like you can't be doing this. Your ego has to develop and figure out like, all right, like what are we going to do? How are we going to compromise here? So the same sort of process. Freud argued that little girls are sexually attracted to dad realize that they can't be with dad instead. So in, instead, they are, are, are envious of, of, of his penis, his status in, in, in society, especially in 1890s, super stereotypic gender roles of Vienna. Um, Freud argued that these little girls will start identifying with mom, right? Their same sex parent and say, hey, if I act just like mom, if I do the same things as mom, then one day I will be able to attract a husband, right? Who's a lot like dad, but someone who's single that's not genetically related to me and so on. So anyway, that's Freud's idea of how personality is shaped. Interesting theory, but the research doesn't back it up at all. Um, here's a really creepy quote, if you haven't heard it before by Shia LaBeouf. That, that Freud would just go nuts on. Shia LaBeouf says, probably the sexiest woman I know is my mother. She's an ethereal angel. Nobody looks like that woman. If I could meet my mother and marry that woman, I would. I would be with my mother right now if she weren't my mother, as sick as that sounds. Very bizarre, very gross, but it kind of fits this sort of Freudian idea. So anyway, that was Freud. You have an id, you have an e super ego, and then you have an ego that kind of manages both. And when you experience stress, if you don't have a developed enough ego, Freud argued that there were defense mechanisms that you could kind of start picking up that would help you manage stress. One of these defense mechanisms was repression. Bury it, kind of push it on down. Um, stick it into your unconscious, don't think about it, just ignore it. Um, and what's, what's unfortunate is when you kind of like repress memories, Freud argued is that they uh, started kind of popping up in, in um, other ways. They would start manifesting themselves physically, like in a psychosomatic conversion disorder. If someone like kept, you know, trying to like repress something and not talk about a stressful life event that happened in the past, 
um, their tummy would start hurting. They would wake up one day and they'd be paralyzed from the waist down or they couldn't see or something like that. Um, so then Freud would argue like through therapy, through dream analysis, like, let's talk about what's going on rather than just relying on this defense mechanism of repression. Um, another defense me mechanism out there is projection. If something is really bothering you, instead of dealing with it yourself, you can project it onto someone else. If, for instance, you are thinking about having an affair and that's causing you a lot of stress to think like your own eyes are starting to wander and you're starting to think about what would this look like, instead of dealing with that, you can say, hey, like my partner, I bet you're jealous. I bet you're thinking about cheating on me, aren't you? And you're just like projecting this feeling that you have onto your partner. So that way you can attack it and deal with it from your partner and not have to deal with it internally. Um, some other, other defense mechanisms out there are just like, are just denying that something is stressing you out entirely or rationalizing it saying, well, yeah, like this is bad, but it's, 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 it's good for these other reasons. And you start making up these other reasons, kind of like rationalize why this person's causing you stress or why life's not going the way that you want it to. And Freud argued that these are just defense mechanisms that an ego will start using to, to satisfy your id and your super ego and not let you be super stressed out all the time. So I bring that up because when you have political psychologists kind of looking at Hitler and Nazi Germany, and you start hearing in the Nuremberg war trials, how many millions of people were killed, you know, via this genocide, how many um, uh, Jews, gypsies, gays, uh, people that had had uh, disabilities and were seen as like not part of this Aryan race these murdered millions and millions of people and political psychologists across the world kept wondering like, well, why, what is it about, you know, the people in Germany? What is it about those Nazi soldiers? How could they do such a thing? How could they listen to such an authority figure and be blindly obedient? Maybe it's their personality. So these personality and political psychologists started developing constructs like well, maybe there's an authoritarian personality trait. And the reason why, why I was just talking about psychoanalytic and Freud is because they drew a lot from kind of Freudian ideas of how, why some kids would develop a preference for authorities, right? And develop an authoritarian personality. And you see this, you see this, there are individual differences, right? Some people score higher on this authoritarian personality trait than others. You see that in the U.S. in 1920s. You saw this in the World Cup in 1938, right before World War II in Nazi Germany. You even see this, you know, in 2010 in North Korea, right? this sort of blind obedience for authority, disliking the outgroup, things like that. And they're similar in this authoritarian personality. So um, in Nazi Germany, they started kind of... Um, kind of pseudo-scientific work. They started looking at what were some of the personality types and they started like masquerading psychological science as a way of saying, well, there's two different types of people in the world. There's the S type that are more kind of liberal in their beliefs and they're weak. They are uh, flaccid, effeminate, and those type of people um, are threats to our, you know, to our country. They are racially mixed. They are uh, uh, stereotypically Jewish and communist. Basically, at that time, the groups that were kind of disliked, that were that enlisted a, a lot of prejudice, Nazi personality psychologists started saying, "Well, they just have this kind of S type of personality that we need to get rid of." Instead, there's another, like a J type of personality, which is ideal. It's tough. It's masculine. It's reliable. It's confident. It is what a what Nazi Germany, what they believe Nazi Germany should be at that time. It is uh, kind of pure from, a, uh, from a, a nationalistic eugenics perspective that, they, yeah, incredibly racist, just using it as kind of justification for treating two types of people differently. In 
in, so in Nazi Germany, they started bringing up these different personality types, but really what they um, were starting to tap into is, is on the Nazi soldiers, members of the Nazi party, some of them were like rushing to the front of the line. They were buying Mein, mein Kampf and reading it cover to cover. They were quick to enlist in the military. They were quick to like um, obey, uh, obey authority figures. And personality psychologists would refer to that them as being high in authoritarianism. You know, the authoritarianism, authoritarianism would really embrace that sort of S and J oversimplified categories of life. Anyway, authoritarian people tend to enforce or advocate this strict obedience to authority. It doesn't matter like your personal freedoms, your choices. It's like that comes secondary. What's best or most important is what the authority figure says is right for us, for that group. So to measure this, Adorno, other personality psychologists at UC Berkeley created the fascism scale or the F scale for short. And it really measured a couple of different dimensions that are really central to authoritarianism. Do you prefer fascism? Do you prefer this sort of dictator, this authoritarian leader? And do you kind of dislike and hate anyone who is a threat to that? So do you suppress criticism? Do you um, embrace nationalism? Do you espouse racism? Anything that you see as being a potential threat to sort of like Aryan race, this dictator, this fascist. And you certainly saw this in Nazi, Nazi Germany, right? You saw this kind of bearing out in their propaganda, kind of celebrating that, you know, that, that blindly obedient person to authority. You started demonizing anyone that, you know, that was seen as different, right? Those sort of outgroups, the uh, Jews, gypsies, gays, people with disabilities, anyone who was seen as, as part of the S type personality. So why would someone do this? Well, according to a psychoanalytic perspective, right? If you were to ask someone like Sigmund Freud, well, what they, what, people with authoritarian personalities were doing is um, idolizing authority, um, this sort of like authoritarian submission, and they were being aggressive towards those outgroups, this sort of authoritarian aggression. So it's just kind of like yin and yang. You have this, this submission, submissiveness to authority, but the sort of aggressiveness to any sort of threats to that authority. And they were using defense mechanisms, according to Freud, like denial, like repression, just not talking about it, kind of pushing it down. You know what, like um, dad, that primary kind of like caregiver that was there early on in life that started shaping your personality, he's liked by everybody, everyone loves them. Um, I've always be, been proud to be, to be my father's son. And what Freud argued is from a very early age, when you're learning to potty train, when someone is there giving you that pacifier, when someone is helping you navigate like how to play on the playground and make friends, those early relationships with your parents are the authority figures. And then later on, when you start growing up, you start going to school, that's like, then the teacher starts becoming more, more of an authority figure. And then the political leader starts becoming that authority figure. And the way you felt towards your parents starts being kind of projected. Um, like you start transferring the same feelings you had towards your parents onto this authority figure. So everyone likes dad, like everyone likes Hitler. It's like, no, they don't. But kind of misconstruing that, that reality, make yourself feel better. Creating this idol, idolization of authority figure. Rationalize. Yeah, 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 like some bad stuff has happened. Yeah, yeah, mom's not always perfect, but you know, that's cause she's nervous sometimes. That's because she's in a stressful situation. She's only She only does that when she's stressed and she's rarely stressed. That same sort of like defense mechanism can be applied for other authority figures. Yeah, Hit, yeah Hitler did this, but it's because, and they started rationalizing it with inadequate rationalizations. Well, it's because after World War I, like we were treated really poorly. So this is just us getting even. It's like, not at all. Right, you are um, euthanizing using genocide to kill millions of people. But anyway, like, how would they make sense of it? Freud would argue, well, they're kind of using this rationalization to idealize authority, be submissive to them. 
And then they started expressing kind of prejudice, racism, um, uh, this favorability for just the Aryan race, their own sort of in group. And Freud would argue, well, there's they're just kind of projecting their own feelings when they feel lust or aggressiveness or any of these negative emotions. Instead of dealing with them themselves, they said, well, like it's those you know Jewish people, like you know the Jews suffer from lust, the Jews are aggressive, the Jews are all about you know like money and control. It's like, no, you in Nazi Germany, Hitler, like you were focused on money and control and you're just projecting that onto the outgroup because it's easier to attack it in someone else rather than recognize it in yourself and deal with it personally. So anyway, the big things to take away here is that in authoritarianism, you have both this authoritarian submission to authority and this authoritarian aggression towards anyone that's deemed part of the outgroup. And that can be explained from this kind of psychoanalytic perspective, according to Freud. Fast forward, I'm not a huge fan of the psychoanalytic approach, but there certainly is such thing as authoritarianism. Some people are, are submissive to authority figures and are really aggressive towards our group. Cognitively, right? How do they think about the world? They tend to be really rigid. The world is black and white, right? It's either right or wrong, it's us and them. No. There are so many shades of gray. There are so many other ways of looking at the world in more nuanced and complex ways. But the um, people that are, are authoritarian are really dogmatic. Um, they're cognitively kind of rigid and like overly structured with how, how they think about the world. They don't see grays at all. And you see this in some of the quotes of someone like David Duke, who is you know, the leader of the KKK today. Um, being really intolerant for any sort of nuance or amb amb ambiguity. So you start hearing quotes that really exemplify this, like the advancement of the white race and separation of white and black races. You know, you know this, this sort of like um, masquerading, um, you know, as like separate but equal. It's like, no, like you're still like separate, you're discriminating, you're treating two groups differently, that kind of rigid way of thinking. So that's authoritarian. Um, it, is, it garnered a ton of research, particularly right after World War II and the Nuremberg War trials came out. They were really curious, like, what's going on in Germany? What's with that, you know, German, like, do they score higher in this authoritarian personality? And there was value in that. There is such thing as authoritarianism. Personally, instead of rushing to blame people's personalities, let's not forget about the social situation. As you know, as a social psychologist, there were systems in place. There was like threats and resentment and authority figures and a lack of oversight and pressure for obedience and conformity that caused anyone in that situation to blindly obey authority. Did authoritarian personalities like factor into it? Yeah. Person by situation interaction. People with authoritarian personality traits are more likely to um, be submissive to authority and be aggressive towards outsiders um, across situations. But that's not just a German thing. That's an American thing too, right? There are people in the US today that score high in authoritarianism. Um, and there are um, uh, certain environments that you can put anybody in that would cause them to be more likely to obey authority than others. So anyway, um, just some food for thought. Authoritarianism fostered a lot of research in that area, and there's certainly value to it when you understand leaders and followers. Some other theories of personality, instead of kind of looking at the traits like authoritarianism, you might think about like, well, what are their motives? What are the motives of leaders, for instance? And research within psychology elicits a few different types of motives that tend to motivate people, that, that encourages them to act a certain way, behave a certain way, seek a certain office. Um, and some of these goals that, that motivate people to do the things that they do might be a need for power, a need for affiliation or intimacy, or a need for achievement. Your need for power 
are the people that want the screens on them. They want to be holding all of the cards. They want to be the person who decides what goes and what doesn't. They want that sort of executive power of like, I can declare war, like, um, or like if I want to like defend America and I want to bomb this group, if I want to fire this person, I can do it. There's some people that gravitate into leadership positions just for the power motive. Other leaders out there are not motivated by power and the sort of like esteem, you know, things like that. Uh, instead, they're, mo they're focused more on like affiliation and social harmony. And they value the group so much. They value community so much that they think if they were in a leadership role, then they could be the person who builds bridges, that lowers the temperature in the room, that gets everyone on the same page and creates that family, creates that community uh, kind of vibe, kind of like, like a repairing, restorative type of president. Other folks out there are more motivated by this need for achievement. They have beliefs, they have legislation and goals and hopes, and they hope that like, if they were in a leadership position, then they could usher in and support this sort of change. They could end a war that, you know, that had been kind of plaguing the, you know, the country. They could end a pandemic that, that's been hurting so many people. They could uh, nominate a new Supreme Court justice. They could uh, usher in tax reform, whatever. Those folks are more no, uh, motivated by a need for achievement. And then kind of looking back, like, what are the things that you did? You, did you create new healthcare policies? Did you, you know, um, you know, preserve social security, whatever, you know, things like that. And what's interesting is when you kind of look at presence over time, you can see kind of individual differences and in what were their motives. And then you can also kind of look at like how prosperous was the economy? Were there any wars started? Were there wars ended? Like what motives of presence tend to be really successful? And what you find is there are really interesting kind of variations here. Most um, recently, prior to President Biden, you had President Trump, who scored very, very high in need for achievement and need for power. Um, valued need for affiliation to like a decent degree, um, but affiliation can be really perceived as like affiliation like within a party rather than like the entire community so like bringing together the like republican party for instance um but anyway it's really interesting to see like differences in need for power trump compared to roosevelt for instance or someone like um who else is going pretty high like george bush 613 obama 670 pretty high in need for power versus need for achievement um, Obama a little lower than someone like Clinton, for instance. What's interesting is kind of over time, you start seeing a general trend, particularly in need for power, starting to increase where we are um, valuing more potentially authoritarian leaders. So kind of talking about presidents, presidents' personality traits, Political psychologists were really curious on like how that process really worked. If you have like um, a president that really values power um, and like achievement and things like that, then afterwards, if this person like burned a bunch of bridges, then do you need a president who is more like affiliation? Are there the kind of cycles of presidential character? It sounds good. It sounds like a really tempting theory that might work. Unfortunately, the research just didn't really bear it out. It doesn't, doesn't stand up well, well to the test of time. Um, political psychologists like James Barber thought there were these presidential character traits um, borrowed from Freudian kind of psychoanalytic pow pattern of like id and super ego. There's some presidents that based on their like, you know, their, you know, their, their style, how they act, how they talk, what they do their worldview, beliefs, what they think is right and wrong, their character, their like, their sense of self, their self-esteem, like based on who these presidents are, some, according to Freud, were more motivated by like the id, taking what they want, seeking the kind of power grabs, you know, like um, filling a bunch of like 
um, Supreme Court justice seats, pushing a bunch of judge positions, you know, things like that. Freud argued, well, like maybe from the psychoanalytic perspective, if you have more of this id for a while, you might need more of a super ego, this like, um, like priest in the White House, like this like really um, calm, kind of like Mike Pence type Christian to like balance out like a little bit more id of a Trump, for instance. The research doesn't really bear that out. Instead, it created more of like a slightly more nuanced grouping of presidents based on presidential character of how much do they enjoy the job and what did they do in the job? You know, did they enjoy it? Were they positive? If so, were they like really engaged in that? Someone like a George Bush who like really enjoyed being president, helped us respond after 9-11, unfortunately got us into wars in Iraq and Afghanistan later on trying to take out um, folks like Saddam Hussein, um, highly engaged, very active, enjoyed the job, different than someone like a Ronald Reagan, for instance, who also enjoyed the job, but was more of that sort of like, you know, cowboy, just kind of like, you know, running the show from, from the outskirts. Um, so like not, not doing the same amount of like micromanaging the same sort of leadership that way enjoyed the job, but isn't putting the same amount of energy in. That's our friend in the White House idea. Other presidents out there really dislike the job, um, but we're still really engaged in it, saying like, I don't want to do this, but we need to. We need someone to be tough. We need to, someone to like revamp this or, um, you know, pull out corruption or, you know, drain the swamp, you know, things like that. That they really dislike the job, but are really active in it. Someone like a Richard Nixon who infamously kind of overstepped and then got impeached because of that or resigned right before he was to be impeached. Um, and other presidents, little satisfaction, they don't like the job and they don't put a whole lot into it. They're just kind of there as like a filler saying, hey, like there's all these committees, things are going on, like someone has to, you know, wear the crown. So, you know, you know, someone has to take on this job, but I don't want it. I'm going to trust some other people to kind of run the show. They're experts, their cabinets, they know what's going to be going on in their offices. Different approaches. Um, and it makes sense that after a while you would have, you know, like high energy people followed by low energy people to give the country a rest. It sounds good, but the research doesn't really bear it out, unfortunately. All right, so that's that's it for our personality and politics lecture. I will see you guys later.